name is uh, Gina Francis Makwabe. I'm the consultant physician and nephrologist uh, working with AHN, Africa Healthcare Network in Tanzania. Um, uh, together with me will be Dr. Uh, Dr. Amar, uh, who is a consultant physician nephrologist working with Shri Hind Mandal here in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, I'll be taking the first part of introduction and Dr. Amar will be taking the second part, which is a question and answers. I would like to welcome you all to today's AHN Nephrology Education Webinar and today's series number 108. And uh, the topic is um, understanding kidney impairment, KDGO, understanding kidney impairment and salt uh, organ malignancies. It's a very interesting topic and this will be covered by, uh, and of course I have a great honor to introduce Professor uh, Yolanta Marazisk. Uh, she graduated from University of Bela, uh, Bialystok and received MD diploma with distinction of the highest note. In 1989, she did her residence and fellowship at the Department of Nephrology and Internal Medicine at the University of Bialystok, Poland. She's a board certified specialist in internal medicine, nephrology, clinical transplantation, hypertension, and diabetology. In 1995, she received PhD at Hamamatsu University School of Medicine in Japan. She organized from scratch peritoneal dialysis program and outpatient hypertension clinic and later second department of nephrology and hypertension with dialysis subunit at the University of Bialystok. Uh, she is a member of executive council of the Polish Society of Nephrology and secretary general of the Polish Society of Transplantation. She was a member of ED, EDRA, EDTA executive council from 2015 to 2018. She was a member of the Executive Council of KDGO from 2019-2021 and was a co-chair of KDGO Controversy Conference on Onconephrology uh, in Milan, December 2018. Her major research interests are hypertension, cardiovascular complications in CKD, iron metabolism and anemia in CKD, onconephrology and biomarkers in acute kidney injury. She is an author and co-author of over 600 original papers in peer-reviewed journals and over 100 review papers and over 50 book chapters, including the famous one, the textbook of clinical uh, nephrology, Oxford textbook of clinical nephrology, which is very popular among our fellows uh, in Tanzania. So, uh, Professor, uh, Joranta, I would like to welcome you, and we are ready and excited to listen to your presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for the introduction and for the kind invitation. Um, I have never been there, I mean, in Tanzania and Kenya and these countries, so uh, at least virtually, um, I'm, 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 I'm really very happy to uh, have an opportunity to say a few words on the very uh, research area of development, which is uh, onconephrology or nephro-oncology. Um, because when with the progress of medicine, and um, it appears that we are, uh, with the progress of uh, oncology, I mean, cancer treatment, also we are dealing with some kind of complications. And when our patients are living longer and longer, uh, we are nephrologists are asked for um, quite a lot of uh, consultations and trying to help our oncologists uh, not only for um, the best possible outcomes, but also for the quality of life. So um, coming to the introduction of onconephrology, it's the very rapidly growing subspecialty. And even in my hospital, like four years ago, we have we have a nephrology on the sixth floor. We have an college department together with endocrinology on the seventh floor and starting to have the common patients. I mean, the patients who were on dialysis, who needed the oncological treatment and also kidney transplant recipients. Finally, we've, we've established the multidisciplinary team and try to work 
together in particular concerning either uh, treatment of nephrological complications or evaluation of the patients uh, with um, concerning the newest treatment in oncology. And this is the subs subspecialty or subspe subspecialization which combines the knowledge and efforts uh, of different groups like nephrologists, oncologists, urologists, and also the intensivist and palliative care specialists. Um, looking at the oncology today, um, We've learned a lot concerning the cancer genomic predisposition syndromes. We also um, learned about the changing risk factors. Uh, so, well, at least in my country, we uh, do not see so many smokers. Okay, uh, we are looking at uh, see more and more e-cigarettes and all the other stuff like that. But we also have that tsunami of obesity, which is a risk factor for cancer as well. Uh, what we are um, experience in, in not only in nephrology, but also in oncology, it's a growing very fast, the armamentarium of new drugs. So there are more and more drugs, more and more new imaging technologies, more sophisticated radiotherapy techniques, and also coming to the surgery, more and more minimally invasive surgery. Uh, and cancer right now, it's not, the, um, I would say, the life uh, sentence. Uh, in generally, uh, if early detected, uh, it, it bears the really good prognosis for a long-term prognosis. And predominantly, today's outpatient care setting is like an ambulatory uh, patient. And this is also includes the chronic disease management for the cancer survivors, because our well, our cancer survivors have like hypertension, cardio cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and all their other comorbidities. And the oncologist's view of the kidney, the kidney is a washing machine. So for in the simple things, it's excretion of anti-cancer drugs and also it excretion of products and kill cancer cells. Pathophysiology for the oncology is very simple. Pre-renal problem is the appropriate pump. Intra-renal, okay, this is devoted to a nephrologist care and we're not taking, uh, even consider whether there are any problems. And post-renal, there is something blocking the plumbing. So it's like um, nephrology, urology, whatever. And this, this was the very, um, I would say, productive and fruitful meeting on onconephrology when we met together. I mean, oncologist, nephrologist, urologist, and uh, we're discussing for um, three days. And finally, we put into the, into the paper our thoughts. Um, we were four groups, and in the first group, we discussed the hematology, uh, hematology problems in oncology and vice versa. Uh, in the second group, we discussed the uh, uh, nephrological problems after oncology treatment, mainly chemotherapy and the therogetic therapies and the new uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. In the third group, we discussed the problems with the renal cell carcinoma uh, and nephrology problems as well. And in the fourth group, we discussed the problems uh, of, with uh, oncological uh, on the cancers in the kidney transplant recipients. Uh, coming to the um, general um, verge between nephrology and oncology, the one point is acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury, it, well, let's say it's a nephrological um, setting or um, nephrological problem, but it is seen in every specialty, in every department of the hospital. And in general, AKI A, and disturbances in electrolyte are the most common features of a kidney disease that are found in patients with malignancy in a hospital setting. And when the patient experiences AKI, we know that it is linked with high morbidity and mortality. And AKI incidence uh, depends upon the type of malignancy, severity of underlying disease, it may be complications of the disease and therapy.
So we do know that there are common risk factors of AKI in cancer patients. It's like dehydration, which is due to the vomiting, diarrhea, obstruction of the urinary tract, fluid and electrolyte disturbances, contrast agent administration, and what I will say a few words later on about uh, contrast-induced nephropathy in cancer patients, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, which are used like oncology sets, it's like, like a candy for everyone, but we have to bear in mind that they affect the hemodynamics and they may uh, be responsible or they may enhance the risk of acute kidney injury nephrotoxic antibiotics, and also renal toxicity of some chemotherapeutic and therogetic drugs. So the pre-renal problem, there's a problem with the pump, how to fix it. Pre-renal, uh, it's generally, uh, the major problem and the major issue is the prevention, which is adequate hydration, this is one point, and avoidance or withdrawal of potentially nephrotoxic agents. So this is the renal uh, or nephrologist problem. So we see that could be the problem with the vascular. Uh, this is a part of hemodynamics. It may be due to the uh, thrombotic uh, uh, macroangiopathy. Uh, it may be related to the glomerular problems. Once again, thrombotic microangiopathy. It may be the uh, glomerular nephritis, C3 glomerular nephritis on ad or other drugs. Uh, in the proximal tubules, it might be the deposition of light chains and also drug effect. In the interstitium, it also might be the deposition of a light chains or uh, drugs which may... Um, cause the interstitial nephritis, uh, lymphoma, leukemia. And in the distal tubules, it could be the cast nephropathy, crystalline nephropathy, like uh, the position of uric acid, calcium phosphate, mainly in uh, tumor lysis syndrome drugs. In collecting system, also they may be the drugs, crystals, or uh, infiltration in the lymphoma or leukemia. So this is the examples how the of the kidney biopsy uh, of uh, thrombotic microangiopathy, toxic uh, acute tubular uh, necrosis, acute tubular interstitial nephritis. On the other hand, it's uh, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis or crystalline acute uh, tubular uh, injury. Um, so this is just a list uh, concerning the possible relations between cancer and um, pathology of the kidney, pathology generally in the, mainly in the glomeruli, like the minimal change disease. Uh, we can see, for instance, in uh, lymphomas Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma in myeloma, as well as in some cancers. Membrana proliferative glomerular nephritis, which might be seen in lung cancer or RCC. Um, IgA nephropathy, also the lung cancer. Membranos, which we know that can be associated with the cancers starting with B, like breast, bowel, and bronchi. Um, amyloid A amyloidosis, it might be seen in some lymphomas or RCC. Um, the post-renal, it's plumbing problem to fix. So we can see the hydronephrosis. Um, we would like to present it. This, this was the... So, which might be... Um, due, for instance, to the deposition of op or obstruction of the urinary, urinary tract. Post-renal, uh, either intratubular or extralinear obstructions are the most frequent causes of, of um, post-renal AKI in patients with a cancer. On the other side, also malignancy should be considered in any patients uh, with bilateral urinary tract obstruction, which is not associated with urolithiasis. Obstruction could be either intratubular or extrarenal. Um, in my clinical practice, I still remember the patient who came to us with a serum creatinine over 30 or 36 with bilateral hydronephrosis, which was due to the pelvic cancer. So it's also we have to bear in mind that. Um, on the other 
In addition, the postrenal AKI could be also caused by urine, uh, uric acid crystals like in tumor lysis syndrome, uh, light chain casts, or crystallization of a certain drugs, for instance, high-dose methotrexate. Um, Obstruction of the bladder outlet or ureter, it's more frequent in cancer patients in comparison to the general population. And also the extralinear obstruction could be caused by a wide range of malignancies like a bladder a cancer, prostate cancer, um, uterus, cervix cancer. Um, what we are also started to see in our clinical practice that if we do have the retroperitoneal fibrosis, it can be secondary to malignancy. But on the other hand, uh, what we've what we've seen uh, in our department as well that many years after the radiotherapy uh, in the pelvis, like in the cervix or uterus cancer or in the prostate cancer, we do see like five or even 10 years later, retroperitoneal fibrosis. And also we, uh, we have to tell that uh, cancer patients may develop urinary tract obstruction, which is unrelated, of course, to malignancy, like for instance, benign prostatic hypertrophy. The most common presentation as we do now is anuria, flank pain, palpable mass or palpable bladder. Usual when, when we do see the urinalysis, it's blunt. In addition, uh, hyperkalemia uh, with non iron gap metabolic acidosis may suggest uh, renal tubular acidosis due to obstruction. Uh, on ultrasonography, we see hydronephrosis, hydrouretor as the most common findings. Uh, concerning the uh, nephrology problem, which is caused directly by the malignancy, it might be the obstruction, it might be the infiltration, intrinsic damage like in the multiple myeloma with cast nephropathy, and also it might be uh, related to hypercalcemia. Um, direct toxicity, which results from chemotherapy agents, they might be either um, thrombotic microangiopathy or glomerular injury due to uh, gemcitabine, uh, VEGF inhibitors, checkpoint inhibitors. Interstitial nephritis in mainly seen, of course, it can be um, related to every drug, but in oncology, it's mainly seen uh, in patients treated with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Tubular injury might be related to platinum compounds, methotrexate, trabectidine, and pemetrexate. Complications of a treatment which might cause perinal AKI uh, in particular, when uh, concomitantly uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or as blockade is administered, maybe it may be caused by severe diarrhea like with irinotecan or um, nausea and vomiting uh, early or late with other chemotherapeutic agents. Intrinsic renal injury might be due to tumor lysis syndrome and obstruction like urothral strictures, previous surgery, and radiation. Other factors uh, might be sepsis, contrast-induced AKIs, nephrotoxins, and we have to take into account bisphosphonates and, of course, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, some uh, antibiotics like aminoglycosides, vancomycin, amphotericin, or intravenous acyclovir. There is also a special uh, setting, which is uh, acute kidney injury, which can be um, can be diagnosed after uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and it might be due to either intra intravascular volume depletion, uh, systemic vasodilation in sepsis, renal vasoconstriction, endothelial injury, which is acute graft versus host disease, total body irradiation and tubular injury with medications like amphotericin, vancomycin, conditioning chemotherapy. We do have our relatively big hematology department with a transplant unit, and uh, they do both uh, autologous and uh, allogenic uh, stem cell transplantation. So uh, quite often we are asked for the consult in hematology department. And also we are uh, 
have our, our experience with graft versus house disease. Another one problem which was discussed quite thoroughly was the assessment of a kidney function in patients with a cancer. Uh, the major issue was cachexia and decreased muscle mass. So the creatinine could be quite low because there were almost no small muscles and therefore the EGFR could look relatively normal. But when we looked at the um, creatinine clearance, it was not so obvious. So when we discussed so many formulas, um, so the formulas were too many and generally uh, at each one of them or every one of them was had some uh, limitations. So when we when we see the um, glomerular centric point of view or the functional assessment of a kidney function uh, uh, in uh, combination with the structural or tubulocentric. So we can see that the gold standard is inulin clearance, but it's not done on everyday basis because it's costly, it's cumbersome. Uh, we also uh, can perform the uh, either eohexal or eotalamate clearances, but generally only for the research purposes or the clinical trials. In everyday basis, we are using some kind of a formulas, like for instance, MDRD, uh, CKD API, or which is known the best in uh, um, oncology ward is Janowitz Williams uh, estimation of a GFR. Generally, uh, our CKD EPI formula is commonly employed to um, those uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents. Um, in some drugs, we are also using Cockroft Gold because in the old drugs, uh, like for instance, um, cyclophosphamide, when they were uh, registered in the 70s or 80s, the Cockroft Gold formula was used for the registration. Uh, concerning the new drugs, uh, which are now um, uh, available in oncology, uh, so uh, there are large molecules like um, antibodies, they could be also the conjugated antibodies like anti-her, anti-her, uh, large peptides like mTOR inhibitors, which are also used uh, in transplantation. Uh, usually they are administered either subcutaneously or uh, intravenously. And all these antibodies and large peptides are usually uh, not excreted uh, by the kidneys. So, uh, Therefore, we do not need to adjust uh, the dose uh, in presence of the kidney impairment. However, we also have the small molecules and they could be either the natural products derivatives like taxans or doxorubicin. Uh, they could be like nucle nucleosid analogs like azacitidine, endogenous ligate der derivatives like growth factors or testosterone. Um, and everything else that uh, we could we could make in in the uh, in our in our factories, um, they could be either administered orally, subcutaneously, intravenously, and they have very variable metabolism and the key, and the renal excretion. So when when they are excreted renally, we have to adjust their dosage to the present kidney function. So uh, we need to uh, check the creatinine before administration of these agents. Chronic kidney disease in patients with malignancy uh, might be caused by the um, toxicity of chemotherapy, like platinum-based drugs, like um, gemcitabine, like um, TKIs or VGF inhibitors. They may be caused by other nephrotoxins like contrast, non steroidal anti inflammatory drug. Uh, they may be uh, related to the nephron loss due to the either partial nephrectomy, nephron sparing nephrectomy, unilateral nephrectomy, and other mechanical issues like intrinsic obstruction of the ureter, extrinsic compression or infiltration of the kidney in lymphoma or leukemia. Concerning the epidemiology, um, there are not so many data available to uh, assessing the prevalence of chronic kidney disease in cancer patients. 
uh, the prevalence reported to be high, but the new therapies, I mean, the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors are generally uh, the prevalence of CKDs uh, not uh, widely studied. Uh, in different reports, the percentage appears as between 33 and 27, so one third. There was two uh, generally big studies, which is called IRMA and BIRMA. IRMA, insuffisance renal et médicaments anticancerés. And BIRMA, it was, uh, it was this, this study done in Belgium. So it was Belgique insuffisance renal et médicaments anticancerés. Uh, which included almost 5,000 patients, and the authors reported that over 60% had abnormal renal function. But at the time, abnormal renal function was defined as normal serum creatinine and EGFR below 90. So we might have like a person who is um, 70 years old with normal serum creatinine, but when we um, calculate the EGFR, it it will be for sure abnormal. Concerning the associations between cancer and the CKD, uh, some authors like Jermaine Wong from Australia found that in men, uh, a lower GFR was a significant risk for cancer, in particular in urinary and lung cancer. In a Danish registry, uh, they in the Danish registry, it was also reported that uh, uh, incidence of uh, malignancy uh, did not increase significantly. However, uh, started from the uh, later period, uh, the prevalence of cancer rose gradually, and the most common cancers related to, to age were skin cancers, breast cancer, cervical cancer, melanoma, followed by colon cancer. Um, it appeared from the published data that CKD itself, it's a risk for cancer and uh, also in dialysis population and the kidney transplant recipients. Uh, the more common were in generally uh, some cancers like um, breast, cervix, and colon. Um, however, it's, it depends upon the registry we are using, it depends upon the population we are studied. Um, what is also appeared that uh, cancer risk uh, rise significantly in early to moderate stages of a CKD, and also it was associated with the uh, worst prognosis, with mortality. So uh, let's put in this way that uh, CKD is a bad prognostic sign and uh, CKD and cancer, it's the much higher risk of uh, mortality. Uh, as we all know that uh, we have two types, uh, generally two types of membranous glomerulonephritis. Uh, the first one is idiopathic, and the second one is secondary, it's mainly secondary to the, some solid tumors like lung, prostate, breast, GI. And also in um, nephrology consults, we also see in, uh, in the patients with graft versus host disease. So that's why if it's possible, it's better to assess PLAR to um, antibody titers. And when we have a PLAR tool, it's usually a sign that it's idiopathic. When we do not have PLAR, the PLAR uh, positivity, uh, we, we can also look for other uh, antibodies like um, against thrombospondin or uh, NEL. Uh, we also try to summarize some um, nephro nephrotoxicity of anti-cancer treatment and also some kind of preventive measures. Uh, for some drugs, like for cyclophosphamide, in generally the adequate hydration and use of N-acetylcysteine uh, works very well to prevent uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. For some others, like um, thalidomide, pomalidomide, uh, uh, leflunomide, um, the adequate hydration, its usually will work perfectly well to prevent against the crystal nephropathy. But in some like um, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, we, we also know only the supportive care. And if uh, we do see the um, 
acute interstitial nephritis. So this is the indication to start with steroids. Cancer and renal replacement therapy. Um, in general, uh, what we do know from the American registries um, that general about 6% of uh, incident hemodialysis patients have malignancies as a comorbidity. When we looked at our data in our dialysis unit uh, concerning the hemodialysed population and uh, patients on peritoneal dialysis, it appeared that 10% of our patients uh, had uh, malignancy as a comorbidity when they started renal uh, replacement therapy. In generally, um, when we looked at the cancer risk and death in patients with chronic kidney disease, um, there is generally site-specific incidence and with a higher prevalence of kidney-related cancer. I mean, uh, um, renal cell carcinoma and car carcinomas of the pelvis, of the, of the bladder. Um, it increased also the risk death by two or three fold. Uh, when we looked at the, our population of a kidney transplant recipients, also the um, cancer is found much more common when we looked at our patients who were uh, evaluated as a, a potential kidney transplant recipients and put on the waiting list, the prevalence of malignancies was relatively low. However, when we have a look at our population of kidney transplant recipients in our outpatient clinic, uh, the prevalence of cancer to reach even 20%, with skin cancer being the most prevalent in our population. When we do have a look at the cancer site and the observed death, so at the very first, generally PTLD, so it means the post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders, which bears generally the high risk of mortality. The skin cancer, however, it's very, very common because it can be seen and it can be detected very early. It bears relatively low risk of malignancy. In patients with a pr uh, previous history of malignancy, when they are evaluated as a potential kidney transplant recipients, we also are afraid that um, cancer can recur in patients after kidney transplantation, after let's say solid organ transplantation. Uh, we also working on the, uh, how long we shall wait for the evaluation for kidney transplantation in the patients with prior malignancy. Um, in the literature, there is a historical data, there is era effect, uh, there are some selection bias, of course, there is a matter of the uh, geographical um, origin like uh, Australia and New Zealand, for instance, they have the very high incidence of uh, skin cancers. Um, so when, when we looked at the um, waiting time and the recommendation for transplantation, so in general, we did agree that there is no waiting time with evaluation for a, uh, to, be a, to be a potential kidney transplant recipients when there is a non-metastatic basal cell carcinoma with the prosthetic cancer, uh, which is microscopic, low, low, focal, low grade, with the incidental T1 renal cell carcinoma, uh, with MGAS, so monoclonal gamma pathy of unknown uh, significance, and superficial bladder cancer. In usual, uh, we also um, agreed or we had a consensus that two years of waiting time should be for invasive blood cancer, in situ breast cancer, melanoma, localized cervical cancer, uh, colorectal cancer stage A or B1, Hodgkin, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, PTLD, leukemia, lung cancer, thyroid cancer, multiple myeloma. But for the five years, we have to wait until we uh, start with evaluation as a potential kidney transplant recipient with stage 2 breast cancer, uh, colorectal cancer stage C, melanoma, a large invasive renal cell carcinoma, and extensive cervical cancer, and non-C2 cancer of the uterus. 
with uncontrolled and untreated malignancy. Of course, it's an absolute contraindication with advanced breast cancer as well, with advanced prostate cancer and with advanced uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, concerning the, the, how to make the decision for transplantation in candidates with a prior cancer. So first of all, uh, we need to know that, uh, of course, the patient's survival rates uh, depend on the tumor type and the stage, uh, given the current treatment. Uh, we also have to bear in mind the effects of immunosuppression on cancer outcomes and the recurrence rates. Uh, and that's why we need to estimate survival rates. We need to estimate uh, survival and the quality of life on dialysis. Uh, estimate the expected survival with transplant without cancer recurrence and should uh, be prepared for shared decision makings between uh, nephrologist, oncologist, patients and caregivers. And then we need to have this individualist approach. We do know that the uh, waiting list for transplantation is not a static list, it's a dynamic list, and everything may be changed, like, for instance, the new uh, therapies which would be available. And, uh, of course, we have to uh, take into account the patient's preference and the quality of life. And as I told that... Um, I will say a few words about the contrast-induced nephropathy. And uh, we all experience in, in our department that when patients need um, CT scan with a contrast, we have to have the serum creatinine. According to the radiologist guidelines, when serum creatinine is over 1.5 milligram per deciliter, uh, on the ambulatory basis, we are not allowed to do the CT scan with contrast. So it means that we uh, we need to um, admit patient to the hospital, uh, give the adequate hydration and sign the paper for radiologists that we know about the possible risks. But uh, concerning our best knowledge, uh, we, will forego, we, will, uh, we will go for the CT scan with contrast because Otherwise, it, won't, it might be difficult to establish the diagnosis, prognosis, and, merit, and make therapeutic decisions. Um, so uh, that's why we um, do CT scans, in particular in patients with malignancy to assess the prognosis, and also in patients with suspected malignancy. Uh, why? Because in generally, when we do perform the CT scan without contrast, very often the results are inconclusive and then we are do this the, the next CT scan with a contrast. So so that's why um, our opinion is that if the contrast uh, is necessary, uh, it's better to do the uh, CT scan with contrast using preventive measures as for instance the adequate hydration. So coming to uh, almost to an end, uh, a few words about uh, oncology challenges. Uh, we know that uh, progress in oncology is extremely fast. Um, there are not so many nephrologists which are interested in oncology because, well, okay, it might be too difficult, time consuming, uh, that difficult uh, patients, challenging patients, ethical issues. Um, complications are treated in nephrology money is in oncology. So we are sometimes we are just joking that we do have the subunit of nephro-oncology. Um, recognition of drugs associated with renal toxicities is usually delayed. Sometimes it's even weeks or months after introduction of oncology treatment. Um, many drugs uh, associated toxicity are generally rare, but could be uh, life-threatening, and therapy associated with toxicities are usually multifactorial. Um, so we try to um, summarize in the algorithm what can we do and can how can we approach the page the oncology patients with the to foresee the possible complications. So first of all, of course, we have to evaluate kidney function. Uh, we need to evaluate comorbidities and ongoing or previous therapies. 
um, check the drug pharmacokinetics, uh, potential nephrotoxicity, uh, interactions, and uh, then evaluate the risk for uh, AKI and CKD as patient-related risk factors, cancer-related risk factors, drug-related risk factors, and finally, plan adequate measures to prevent AKI and other organ toxicities, like, for instance, maintain fluid and electrolyte and acid-base balance, avoid hypertension, eliminate or minimize other potentially nephrotoxic drugs, monitor blood pressure, monitor proteinuria, consider readjustment of anti-cancer drugs based on the changes in the renal function, and also try to foresee the drug, indica the, the drug interactions. So from, from our no nephrology perspective, we really do appreciate um, consults from different specialities. And on the other side, and on the other side, as I was told when I went to a cancer center in, in Houston, the biggest um the biggest group of consultants are nephrology consultants in the cancer centers, followed by cardiologists. But uh, concerning the cardiologists, we are fully aware of our heart function, and also the cardiologist is. Uh, I cannot I cannot say it's considered the, the better or the most important uh, specialty in comparison to nephrology, but uh, I think that the cardiologist started much much earlier to talk about the toxicity of anti-cancer uh, therapies. Then and right now, uh, nephrologist took their place and start to uh, discuss the possible uh, nephrological complications and how to prevent them. Um, in summary, uh, there, are there is a plethora of renal problems that can be found in the cancer patients. Uh, they may influence not only the short-term outcomes, but also the long-term long -term outcomes and also the therapy of underlying malignancy. Uh, These kidney-related problems is an important challenge for both nephrologists and the medical oncologists. And uh, the, incid uh, the incidence rates for many malignancies right now are increased, in particular in developed world. And the amelioration of mortality is due to more effective chemotherapy uh, with new drugs like targeted drugs, uh, stem cells. And that's why the population of cancer survivors increased uh, enormously. And we are dealing with a cancer survivor as uh, uh, patients with uh, with uh, all the as a chronic with as a chronic disease. Um, Chronic kidney disease is generally under-recognized, so therefore we need to check the creatinine and EGFR to know how to adjust the drug, at, in particular to the present kidney function. We should not uh, postpone or avoid uh, imaging with a contrast, not to delay the diagnosis and to ameliorate the prognosis. Um, and then my final slides, uh, there is a Murphy's Law concerning the law of specialties. Uh, the quality of provided healthcare is universally related to the number of participating specialists. And William Osler, which uh, was living in Canada and US in the 19th and 20th century, told that the good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. Thank you. Wow, that is an excellent presentation, Professor. Um, uh, Dr. Amar, would you like to take the second part for question and answers? Definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Makabe. Yeah. I would personally like to thank Professor Yolanta and the KDGO for helping us access such a high quality nephrology uh, session. So thank you very much. Uh, before we get started, uh, I would... Uh, have you all used the Q&A chat box and uh, the regular chat box to post your questions for Professor Yolanta. And also, if you would raise your hand, we would give you permission to talk and you can ask your question live. Uh, as we start, I would like to invite uh, Professor Kajiru Kalonzo, who is a senior uh, consultant physician and lecturer 
at the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center in Moshi in Tanzania to, to ask his or, or, or to give us his comment while we prepare other questions. Professor Kajiru, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Amir Ali, and uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for uh, the session. And uh, uh, Professor, that was uh, quite a, a comprehensive uh, uh, overview of onco-nephrology and uh, the um, subtle problems uh, uh, we face every day. Um, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, uh, the number of consults we get uh, in the oncology ward. Uh, uh, even in the non-oncology, I, I like that <laughs> statement, even in the non-oncology ward, we get a lot of consults for oncology patients. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, I, I really in, in, in enjoyed um, yeah, your presentation. It's quite um, wide. So uh, when I think when I think about the oncology and the onconephrology, the first thing is uh, they have refused to give uh, uh, chemotherapy saying the creatine is high. So they want me to do some sort of magic uh, to decrease the creatine. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, uh, most of the time uh, it ends up to being CKD, but they say, okay, um, after you die, they ask, after you dialyze, can we give chemotherapy? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't know. This is now a question for any, every and anyone whether um, uh, you're faced with such uh, um, a problem. And uh, when I when that starts, uh, when that question comes up, uh, it's obviously a problem of of, of understanding understanding kidney um, uh, function. That is, after you dialyze a patient, you still have a low GFR anyway. Yeah. yeah? Uh, even though the creatine is low, so um, I, 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 I've sometimes had to explain this several times, uh, and uh, it's a recurring problem. I, I don't know if uh, uh, maybe there's an easier way of explaining this uh, in uh, in a medical school uh, that the GFR and a low creatine after dialysis are two uh, different things. So anyway, I'd I, I, I'd like to know if if other people are getting the same. Problem now, but but the other issue is uh, is really ethics. I, I know you touched a little bit about mm -hmm. ethics, and especially in our environment where um, uh, we should actually be rationing uh, um, uh, dialysis, and uh, the resources are not enough, uh, mm -hmm. um, even if we have people who are insured, and uh, and our national guideline actually does mention. If you have uh, an, an an advanced incurable uh, malignancy, uh, um, you should actually not start dialysis. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's not clear where whether you should uh, stop dialysis in somebody who's uh, who's not being treated for uh, the malignancy and uh, um, uh, is otherwise okay. But so so there's there's, there's that great suspicion where. If you're going to ration dialysis, or you you're really thinking of resource, uh, um, uh, uh, what should we do? Uh, and uh, and and then this is not only for you, Professor. The question is, I think, even for my other colleagues in Tanzania, um, uh, what do they do? I tend to um, uh, uh, to to lean on the patient and and uh, try and make patient uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, feel better and uh, and uh, ameliorate the symptoms. Uh, as much as far as I can, uh, but at some point, um, uh, I, uh, uh, eventually we have to stop stop the, the dialysis uh, when when the when, when eventually therapy becomes no, uh, um, uh, not helpful. So um, with the ethical question, I'm I'm uh, right quite interested even to hear from uh, Professor Bima, uh, although yeah, uh, I, I know in South Africa uh, that's quite clear. Eh? Clear cut in, in rationing, but I, I'm I'm curious about the children with the malignancies, uh, uh, how they deal with it. So over to you. What I can tell you when when I was in a young nephrologist, it was 30 years ago. Um, we have a commissions of life and death, where we're not able to start dialysis without the permission of this particular commission because there were no enough dialysis units, uh, and even later on the 
um, malignancy stage four was the absolute contraindications to start hemodialysis. So, um, well, I went through all this ethical stuff and it was extremely um, um, tough for me uh, when I was a young, young doctor on duty um, to my, well, I cannot say to make the decisions, but to, to follow the, the, these regulations. Uh, now it's much, much better, but still, uh, when uh, there is uh, a, a patients with a malignancy, when it's acute setting, I mean, acute kidney injury, we are rather go for dialysis because this is reverse. We think that it's it might be reversible. If it's end-stage kidney failure, and the patient is requiring dialysis. And uh, in the same time, there is a disseminated malignancy stage four. So what we are doing usually, it's like a meeting in the, well, let's say multidisciplinary team. I mean, medical oncologist, um, nephrologist, um, senior nephrologist to make and family, patient and the family to make the shared decision whether, because, well, it's, it is a special term that it's kind of a, a therapy which does not prolong life but does prolong misery so that's 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 our attitude towards this kind of a situation thank you very much and uh, since yeah. professor bima has his hand up already mm -hmm. i would invite him to uh, thank yeah, you yeah yeah so um, um and and the, it, if a patient is already on dialysis and uh, is actually doing well despite having the mm -hmm. stage four disease, mm -hmm. um, uh, do, you, do you still continue with the dialysis uh, or, uh, I mean, uh, uh, continue supporting the patient despite that and, uh, as, uh, and not on chemotherapy? Uh, um, uh, yeah, so that, that, that's also quite uh, um, uh, difficult. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this. With this, thing. this Let's say it's it's very difficult. Uh, if it's if the patient is doing well despite the stage four malignancy, uh, in general we do continue until the uh, deterioration and when there is a state when the, there is a, we, the clinical evident deterioration. Usually we are started to talk mainly with the patient and with the family. So that's that's right now a different scenario when it was um, several years ago in, in my country. So, Professor Bima, would you like to add to that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Lander, for that excellent presentation. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I must say, um, our situation is very much similar to yours. If we have an uh, uh, oncology patient and the situation is that dialysis is offering some type of palliative care where it improves the quality of life of the patient, even if the cancer we know is going to be progressive and not responding to treatment, we will offer that patient short-term dialysis. Now, the choice is then to decide how long do you continue? I think that's what uh, Prof. Uh, Kajira was asking, how long will you continue dialysis? And that's a very difficult one to answer. So sometimes in the unit, when we are faced with this, especially with children, it becomes a very emotive problem. Because emotionally, you know, everyone's like saying, uh, well, you know, we shouldn't with Docker, we should do this. Uh. So I tell them, look, we will offer the, the, the dialysis as long as the lines don't block, as long as we don't end up with a severe infection. So if there's any complication that needs us to withdraw or to change anything with regards to dialysis plan, we will not escalate treatment. You understand what I mean? to say this is what it is. But there's no easy answer to, to, to this problem. And I must say, we also have a multidisciplinary team and then we discuss it. And if the team decides that, look, there's really no point in going with the care, we call in the palliative team uh, specialists and then they take over and then they offer palliative care. So, uh, Prof. Jigaru, that's the, what we, we do uh, in our setting. I don't know what the rest of the units in South Africa do, but that's what we do. So, <clears throat> uh, Prof. Lander, that brings me to a question that arose recently in the unit. We had a patient with rhabdomyosarcoma arising from the bladder. And so we were called in and the patient had a, 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 a coexisting infection with the disseminated intravascular coagulation. So platelet counts were low, patient had a bit of bleed, nasal bleed, etc. 
And one of the consultants uh, opted for peritoneal dialysis. Mm -hmm. And the debate came up, if you're doing peritoneal dialysis, will this disseminate the tumor or not? And my own feeling is that, look, if the tumor is already spread interperitoneally, whether you offer dialysis or don't offer dialysis, peritoneal, in, in, I mean, uh, peritoneal dialysis, it's already there. So it's not going to cause any more problems. Than what, in fact, dialysis can be used in some instances to deliver chemotherapy, et cetera. I just like to know your thoughts on this. How would you, would you approach the problem? Um, what we are doing well uh, with the peritoneal dialysis uh, right now, it's the vast, with the vast minority, I would say in Poland, it was in 5% of all dialysis patients. So, um, and in particular with chemotherapy, the infection rates are much, much higher. Uh, so what we, and also with the peritoneal clearance and residual renal function, it's slightly more difficult to adjust the drug dose. What we are doing with our oncologist, um, we start, usually we start with a permanent catheter and uh, we try to adjust the chemotherapy as our oncology would like to deliver it uh, in combination with hemodialysis. Like um, very recently we had a patient, a 35 year old with a seminoma, um, with the failing kidney, kidney graft. He had a kidney graft for 17 years and his creatinine was close to 3, 3.2 with a GFR like 18, 19. The oncologist would like to uh, treat uh, the patient with uh, um, gemcitabine, if I do remember correctly, and etoposid, bendamustin, um, and what they decided that uh, they will start with the chemotherapy and we will do the dialysis like um, eight hours after to clear uh, the toxic products. So we, we try to do like that with, um, like for instance, with ovarian cancer, they, they are doing chemotherapy and we do have the dialysis next day. So in it's generally, it's very individualized. Um, and if we do know that it will be the definitely nephrotoxic agents like cisplatin. Um, so we are trying to explain the patient and the family that this, the drug is too toxic to the kidneys, that it's better to start dialysis treatment uh, just after the, 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 the first course of the chemotherapy, then to start like, for instance, with a cisplatin and then uh, put uh, the catheter, etc. So it's, it's, I would say it's evaluated it on um, on a very very personal basis in um, trying to take into account all the um, indications and contraindications. With some drugs, the problem is that um, if there is um, it is called in pollen therapeutic program, uh, like for instance for um, VGF um, antagonist or TKI, we are allowed to give the drugs until the creatinine is. Two. Uh, we are not allowed to give the drug in creatinine over two, but if the patient has creatinine like four, we start dialysis treatment to enable the patients to be treated. Uh, in particular, when, uh, when oncologists think that there will be very good response and there is, a, um, I would say, the good chances to, to have the, the, the remission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think my question is asking is, do you think that peritoneal dialysis is an absolutely contra contraindication? Remember, we are dealing in low middle income countries. I, I, no, um, that's not no. my, um, well, yeah. I don't think that it's absolutely contraindicated. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Prof. Thank you, Professor Bhima. Uh, thank you. Dr. Yolanda, please allow me to introduce uh, Professor Francis Furia, who is a consultant pediatric nephrologist and rheumatologist. Uh, working with the Moimbili National Hospital in uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I would like to welcome him for a question or a comment. Professor Francis? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ama. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the talk that was given by Professor and uh, also the comments that were given by and the questions that were asked by Dr. Kajiru. I think we are facing the same uh, challenge when we are seeing patients. And I guess the biggest problem is the fact that we see these patients individually as single discipline. So it is the oncologist that see patients and then say, please, we are referring you to the nephrologist for dialysis. 
So I guess uh, having a disciplinary team, you know, working together and making decisions, that is an excellent idea. Maybe this is something that we should all, all think about. Again, again, then the other, the other biggest challenge is the fact that uh, there are times when you have CKD in our setting, you start thinking of palliative care because of the difficulties and logistics and financial constraints you know, in, 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 in being able to access dialysis. And, and that, that picture becomes more difficult when you are faced with malignance again. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, it's, it's the challenge. And I would say that what I'm looking, what I, what I see now, I see us working in the 30 years that uh, Prof described when she was a young nephrologist. I guess that's where we are sitting. And I guess it's the same kind of feeling that Dr. Kadiru might be feeling. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you, Professor Francis. So we'll move to the chat box now. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Keshi Srija, who is a, a consultant, senior consultant nephrologist at the Benjamin Kappa Hospital in Dodoma in Tanzania. Uh, thanking you for the one, wonderful session, but also uh, asking you uh, for your take you know, on the prognosis of a patient, uh, cancer patient who succumbs to kidney impairment. And since the oncologists stopped their medicine, waiting for the nephrologist to take over, what kind of challenges would you face and how would you go about solving this? Do you mean that uh, oncologists, they stop the treatment waiting for a nephrologist? I believe that's what, uh, that's what he would like to know. Well, um, we are, I guess we are much more fortunate because we have oncologists uh, on, the, on, the, on the next floor. So we usually, on, well, I did not have I did not have the situation when they stopped the, the treatment because usually they called us and we start to think to to make the decision at well, more or less the same or the next day. Um, if there is a if there is a patient who is uh, they they finish with an oncology treatment, so uh, usually if it's the patient who is an end stage kidney failure, um, so we start to figure out whether uh, to start any treatment or rather to uh, to save for palliative care. So that's that's my personal view. And Thank also, you. Some, and also, well, uh, from also from from our perspective, if there is a um, young person who has um, some issues to be settled, like I don't know, maybe some work issues or some financial issues, etc. So. Uh, we would rather go for start to start the renal replacement therapy to enable the person to to settle all the, all this stuff. I don't know if it's um, I can um, ex explain correctly what I do mean, but in in some uh, I'd say life situations uh, that's why we would like to 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 give the, the to give the time to give the chance to to settle all the all the all the things which is are really important either for the person or for the family or like if they have like um small kids to um enable to find uh, the care for the kids for the future something like that thank you very much uh, i see professor kajiru has another comment professor kajiru i don't know i, I thought you were going through the comments if the comments were the use of dialysis post chemotherapy from an agent which is poorly dialysable is rather questionable. Um, at that time, it uh, the issue I uh, was uh, concerning the uh, etoposite, and uh, our oncologist thought that uh, because the patient started dialysis, so it would be better to uh, uh, to to make them dialysis um, for seven or eight year, uh, hours later than to start immediately after because they were afraid of some well toxic metabolites so that was um that was the i would say um suggestion or recommendation that we can adjust dialysis after the chemotherapy okay i got it thank you thank you professor kajiru uh there's a, a moral dilemma uh brought up by Dr. Alfred, and uh, you know, he he's just curious to know if you find yourself cornered when there's nothing further to be done for a patient. If it's this kind of, we had the kind of situation quite recently with the um, refugees from the um, from the war zone. Um, so we tried to um, explain the the patient and the family that we are just, I cannot say we came to an end, but we have nothing more to offer. 
And this is the time uh, when we also discussed the, the palliative care, but in general, much more hospice care. And I, I would say that um, despite more than 30 years when I do work as a nephrologist, this is the most, uh, still the most emotional part. I'm sure it must be very challenging. Uh, we have a couple of clinical questions, but uh, Professor Yolanta has shared her email address, so I hope you would be happy to uh, to answer them by email, Professor Yolanta. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Lloyd to, to come in for a closing comment and give a vote of thanks to Professor Yolanta. Yeah. Dr. Lloyd? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yolanta. Uh, that was a wonderful session, uh, very comprehensive, extremely well covered, and I think a lot of interest in terms of questions. Uh, and uh, extremely grateful for your time. We're also thankful to the KDCO for having uh, brought you in here. And I have to apologize for the last time that we missed the session as well. Uh, it was a misunderstanding. I'm extremely sorry for that. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It, it, um, it has, it is, I think, a very important field, a very commonly encountered problem. Now, oncology problems are very much, we find a lot of them in, uh, uh, in, in the dialysis population in Africa that we see across the board. Uh, at least uh, in to the centers, I see there are patients at some point in time during the, you know, in, during the quarter of the year. And I think it's a very, very important problem. And that it's probably hidden. And, and not recognized. And it's good that you brought it up and it's really nice that the KDGO has brought out all this and, uh, and you're taking the leadership on this. Thank you so much, Dr. Yolanta. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, generally the final sentence, I would tell that what I just tell my, to my French oncologist that um, patient with oncology has much better prognosis than the patients uh, with end-stage kidney failure on dialysis. But the oncology, let's put it, is it's sexy, it's promising, has so many treatments and so many opportunities. We are, as a nephrologist, we are a little bit uh, on the, um, like in the hidden place. But still, it, uh, it seems to me that uh, we are still needed. And nephrology is brainy. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very That's much. great. Have a good evening.